My name is Stuart Steinhauer. I'm from Saddle Lake, Green Nation, and uh, born in 1952. Let's see, I wasn't exposed to any art or uh, especially not sculpture when I was young. I don't even recall seeing any. It was like vegetables at supper time. I don't really remember seeing them uh, until later when I was a, a young adult. Uh, when my first child was born, the birth of, of that child was a cathartic experience. The next day, I made a carving for my brand new son, my first child. He's going to be 45 this summer. I've been carving ever since. The first 17 years of carving, uh, it was always in response to some sort of a cathartic, or some sort of a traumatic experience or event. As a younger person, I didn't know how to articulate what I was feeling or experiencing. I was very mute and of course yeah, I see lots of young people that are like that. Uh, I went through lots of trauma as a child, went into a period of pretty intense addictions as a young adult. A really typical pattern. The carving was a way to spontaneously, I guess, without a plan, to start healing whatever it was that was damaged inside of me. Uh, there was no longer the trauma that was triggering. I was just started producing work, but I was going into a phase where I was sitting in ceremony, sitting in a sweat lodge. I was immersed in this cultural stuff. I started fasting. I started participating in all these things. And you know, at that time, I didn't know my dad had been there, my grandpa had been there years, you know, generations, that all this stuff had been going on, for me it was brand new. And, uh, and pretty thrilling, really thrilling. And creatively, just like dynamite, there was all this stuff that was, had been pushed down. And it was suddenly coming up. Then my cousin Vincent said to me, Vincent said, well, well let's go to the mountains where the old people used to go. Let's go there and fast, just you and I, a blanket fast, we'll make tobacco ties, blanket and take our pipes, cloths. And the first fast, we both were visited by bears. I set myself up. It was miserable weather, early June. It was raining, but we were right at the snow line. It's, uh, the, the Saskatchewan River comes off that big glacier there in the Columbia ice fields. It comes out across the prairies. So we're just a little ways from that glacier. Through the middle of the night, I was feeling very miserable. And fasting, fasting is never easy. It's always challenging. And so there I was under this spruce tree, soaking wet, just at the snow line of the, this raining night. And uh, all of a sudden, I saw this little bear coming by. He was quite comical. Like just looking at him, you know, made me feel kind of giddy, laughing. And so I was watching him. And all of a sudden, I realized there was a second bear, and this bear was just massive. It was an outsized bear. It was too big to be a bear, but it was. There was a, the moment was so intense. The bear was right there. I grabbed my pipe and lifted it, and the bear just. The pipe was gone, and the bear got on top of me, and pushed me down. And I realized the bear was talking to me, but not in words and not out loud. There was this mind-to-mind -mind communication. And the bear was saying, don't just lay there, you got to do something. And, and so here I was face to face or, you know, with this bear pinning me down. And I realized that what the bear was saying was I, I had to do something, I had to move. Even though it felt hopeless, it felt ridiculous, impossible to respond to the power of the bear. And when I tried to respond, then the whole scene changed and we no longer were in, in the forest, we were on, on the Kootenai Plains. I was no longer with that bear. Instead, I was in my ch childhood home with my dad. And the home was, was totally wrecked. It was like uh, it had gone way in the future. But there it was, it was still standing. It was uh, abandoned and completely dilapidated. But he and I were together inside there. And there was this little bear. A little bear was there, and, and I was watching the bear, and the bear said, the bear was saying to me, this is what I look like. 
And then the bear started to move in space and began turning slowly in these funny little motions, showing me everything, every possible position that this bear could be in. And, and then that, that moment passed and uh, my dad said, well, let's chase that bear out of here. And so we started herding the bear to the door. We got him to the door and the bear grabbed me by the finger and bit, but he didn't bite to take off my finger. He just bit hard enough to leave a ring, two rings of numbers on my finger. And then it stopped and I woke up. And I realized, well, I couldn't, I couldn't decide what was going on. There I was under the tree. It was raining. I was freezing. Uh, there were no bears. There was nothing of what I had just experienced. And yet all of that, it seemed very, very real. But uh, I went back from that fast and I started carving bears. I had never carved a bear before. But the bears I, the bear I carved then was it the bear that I met in whether it was a dream or, or whatever it was, you know, it wasn't really truly in this world, although it was part of this world, and thus the bear I've been carving ever since.